The quiet residential nature of today's Plymouth Avenue belies its history as a vital artery in a bustling neighborhood. And because of racially charged riots in the late 60s, Plymouth Avenue has become Minnesota's place name for division and conflict. But the past the street represents is more complex than the headlines and simplified history suggest. In 1946, a, an American journalist named Kerry McWilliams called Minneapolis the capital of anti-Semitism in the United States. Because you have this, you know, oppression laying over the entire community, it kept them together. And so what that meant is that there were a lot of community institutions here, plus a whole street of shops on uh, Plymouth Avenue. We had Jewish bakeries. They had a pool hall. And a, bowling and a bowling alley. And then the Homewood Theater, for heaven's sakes. And delicatessen. And delicatessens. Where you can get the best sandwiches that ever were. I dreamt about Plitman's last night. I dreamt it was still there. It was a delicatessen uh, on um, Plymouth. Stillman. I worked there. Yes, you did. It was the first supermarket on Plymouth Avenue, it was a big deal. But nostalgia alone doesn't give a full picture of the complexities of community history. There were fissures in the Jewish community having to do with class, having to do with relationships with other communities outside the Jewish fold. I think it's very hard to tell the story and to tell the story well without coming to grips with those internal tensions and uh, complexities. Plymouth Avenue ran, as the Minneapolis Tribune described it, across the Jewish community from modest homes at the Aldrich Avenue end to mansions in Homewood at the western edge. And you have rich Jews and poor Jews. If you lived on the east side, I'm sure you knew that the people who lived in Homewood were a hell of a lot wealthier than you. I felt the difference. We were very poor. They made you feel that we were different. When you grow up, you know that you're okay. Yeah. When you're a kid, you don't know you're okay. But they all went to North High. They all hung out on Plymouth Avenue. So I can say that the fissures were as deep as they were in a place like, like New York. So Plymouth Avenue offered a vantage point of class differences from one side of Jewish life to the other. In the mid-60s, the street became home to a black organization that would symbolize changes in the community. I was drawn here because of the founding of the Way in 1966. I was invited by Syl Davis, who's no longer with us, was involved in youth work. The Way, a cutting-edge community center established in a Plymouth Avenue storefront, was at the center of racial issues when a now-familiar phrase became part of the American lexicon in the late 60s. The thing that was being talked about every year was the long, hot summers. The long, hot summers, you know, Watts, Detroit, <laughs> Newark. The series of long, hot summers of urban rebellions that began uh, to become regular features of the American landscape. There were two consecutive summers that we had disturbances in 66 and 67. And of course, like many communities across black America, Plymouth Avenue was occupied for a week or two, at least a week, by American soldiers. We shouldn't forget that. The accounts vary as to how and why the riots started on those summer nights of the 60s. A young emerging leader from the way named Harry Spike Moss pointed out that it was the long winters of do-nothing that led to the long, hot summers of violence. This statement does seem to capture the sense of disillusionment, the lack of opportunity, education, and jobs at the end of the civil rights era. While the outbreaks called needed attention to these issues, they also accelerated the exodus of Jewish residents out of North Minneapolis. People that own the businesses on Plymouth Avenue, these people were immigrants. They came with nothing, started with push carts. Most of them were just poor people trying to eke out a living, and they were burnt out. And yeah. that, to me, that is the sadness that I feel sometimes when I think about North Minneapolis. There had always been some tensions, but 
My family always had a nice rapport with the Jewish mer merchants along um, Plymouth Avenue, and um, but times were different. I mean, it was exploding all over America at that time. I think as a community with the labor and uh, liberal roots, a community that saw itself as largely progressive, a community that understood that it had common cause to make with other marginalized communities, came as quite a shock that Jews were nevertheless identified as uh, on the other side. And I think it makes perfect sense for Jews to be uncomfortable with the fact that the dynamic had something to do with Jews being absorbed into the larger privileged sectors of American society more quickly than African Americans, and perhaps a sense of guilt to some degree about that occurring, but, uh, but a willingness to benefit from that process in ways that I think African Americans saw frustrating and perhaps saw more clearly and more starkly than most members of the Jewish community could allow themselves to consider. And so the avenue was the code word for all of that history. It was never even called Plymouth, it was just called the avenue. Older people who were there, and remember this, uh, don't want to talk about it. It's very significant to know that the police precinct is exactly on Plymouth Avenue, where the way was. That's more than symbolic, that's erasure. I think it's important to keep in mind that there was a significant degree of movement by Jews out of the North Side much earlier, dating back to uh, returning GIs in the 1940s. In fact, the Jewish migration was just part of a larger movement out of North Minneapolis and the urban core. My family moved. We were one of the first families to move to St. Louis Park. So all of my Jewish friends that I had in North Minneapolis were still my friends when I went to St. Louis Park. One of the big turning points, I would say, would, was when Bethel decided to move. That was a big fight. And that's when I was running around telling, don't move, don't move. I didn't want to see everybody disperse, and they did. And uh, so many of the congregation followed. Our family did not follow that uh, pattern, and um, I am forever grateful for the opportunity to have spent the rest of my childhood years on the North Side. When I meet anybody new, the first thing they'll say is, are you still there? I say, yes. Well, aren't you afraid of the blacks? That's the other question. And I tell them that they're my best friends. So, and, and this whole neighborhood is very mixed. Very, very mixed. We have the Hmong and the Vietnamese and the blacks and the Jew. And, <laughs> and so it's terrific. So even after the Plymouth Avenue riots, Dorothy Jacobs, Earl Swartz, and other Jewish residents remained on the north side. At that time, new families were moving in, including idealistic young educators like George and Beverly Roberts. Many teachers moved in. On my block at one point, there were six teachers. And so there was a great rebuilding of a community here around the kind of social issues that you associate with the 60s. Much of this spirit and leadership came from Bernadette Anderson, who lived just off Plymouth on Russell Avenue. An activist and civic leader, Anderson was like a mother to the community and became the mother of the Minneapolis Sound in the 70s when she took in a neighborhood teen. And my mother, I miss and I love her, Bernadette Anderson took Prince into our home. He went to school with my brother Andre, and he was having problems at home. And my mother let Prince stay while he worked out his problems at home. He ended up having a career from our home. Prince would leave our home here, and he would catch the bus to Central High. So in a way, Plymouth was Prince's avenue to success in arts and entertainment. George Roberts saw the potential of community building through creative expression in an old pickle factory across the street from Prince's bus stop. And this particular building was a grocery store, clothing store, an Amway store for a while, a hardware store, whatever the community needed. By the 80s, we had a couple of neighborhood inconvenience stores here, and there was some drug selling that was going on, so the community got together and, and 
drove those people out of business and out of the neighborhood. And then I continued walking by on my way to North in the 80s, saying, boy, that's a beautiful old building. We bought this place, and the vision was art, it creates the bridge. And these are the last three buildings from that period of the Plymouth Avenue business complex. From here all the way to the river, these are the last three buildings. Recently, Roberts salvaged those iconic stars of David from a Plymouth Avenue building that had been a church, synagogue, then church again. I think they could easily create a monument or a sculpture piece that sits out along Plymouth Avenue. But that's the, sort, the sense that we have from living here. There is a history we want to preserve, and that's, I think, what all of us who have buildings here is feeling. This is at least one place where we can start to point and say, Plymouth, this is a place that's got deep roots.